The commission updated its guidelines to reflect lessons learned since the pandemic, ensure judges can continue to take first steps towards second chances for those who deserve them, and reunite families through appropriate re entry. Judges are in the best position to decide if someone deserves to have the length of their sentence revisited, said Chair Reeves. This policy trusts courts to continue doing what is right. Over a million Americans face sentencing every year, and it will be the most important day of their lives. But we don't fully understand the system, how broken it is, and what we can do to make it better. I'm Doug Passan. I'm a 25-year criminal defense lawyer and a sentencing expert. My goal is to bring more awareness, more fairness, and more humanity to the sentencing process. So, are you ready? Then let's get set for sentencing. Hey everybody, Doug Passon coming to you from Studio 3553, Scottsdale, Arizona. Man, big doings at the Sentencing Commission. Uh, yesterday, as of the day we're, we're recording this podcast, we have so much to talk about they met and voted to adopt a number of guideline amendments to you know amendments to the united states sentencing guidelines and they also punted or voted down a couple of biggies so to break it all down of course who who else are we going to have back to help us get set for sentencing but my good friend mark allenbaugh returning champion we're going to talk about what passed, what didn't, and when we can start raising these issues and sentencing and all kinds of other good info. There were like 10, I think 10 maybe total amendments. We're not going to talk about all of them. We're going to focus on uh, three of the most consequential amendments. So how you doing, Mark Allenbaugh? Welcome back. Let's dig in. Okay. Doing well, Doug. Thank you. So yeah, let's, let's dig in here. So I am going to um, share the screen here. And uh, let's see, move, move on up. Um, can we see yeah. this here where it says amendments to the sentencing guidelines? Yeah, well, I can okay. see it. I can so see this, it. This was, this was passed yesterday. So what happened yesterday is uh, for the first time in five years, uh, a full complement of the commission, which is seven commissioners. Uh, we haven't had seven commissioners in over five years, uh, met and voted on promulgating uh, 11 different amendments and decided to punt on a couple. Um, and so this is pretty significant. We, we haven't had a commission in, in five years. So, you know, they had a lot of work to do. And, uh, you know, they, they, had, they had already gone through the amendment cycle. They had published back in, um, I think it was August, proposed amendments. And then they yeah. took a lot of uh, information from everybody, from the public. Uh, and uh, uh, published some proposed amendments, got feedback on that, and then refined them, and yesterday uh, the, uh, published them. Now, what they're going to do with these amendments is send them to Congress on May 1, and Congress has six months to uh, act as a full body and decide whether or not to... Uh, 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 they, Congress doesn't have to do anything. The only thing Congress can do uh, is veto essentially these amendments, which it rarely does. So the point is, if Congress does nothing in those six months on November 1, uh, 2023, these amendments will become uh, will become law. In other words, really the way we would say it is they become effective. Yes. Um, but yes. if Congress yes. decides to act, and we could talk about this, uh, to the contrary, um, they, they, they would have to act as a full body. They would have to um, uh, basically pass a, a piece of legislation, which is going to require both houses, it's not easy to do, uh, to veto whatever the commission has proposed. Yeah. So, so well, let's stop there for a second. So, yeah. um, and we won't keep you in suspense for anybody who's listening. We're going to talk about um, criminal history, what we call true first offender, which is yeah. going to be a major, major shift. Amazing. Yeah. We're going to talk about compassionate release, also a major, major shift. And we're going to talk about acquitted conduct. Now, there's a report that's up here on the screen that you're referencing. I'm going to put yeah. that link in the show notes because it's like a 200-page yes. report. So anybody who wants right. to do that reading themselves, go for it. It the has other the, thing all is, the amendments. Yeah. yeah, it has all the amendments. Because um, mm. like I said, we're only going to hit the biggies today. But you know, I just get, get, you know, I want people to take away that even though November 1 is the big date where these things hopefully go into effect officially, 
Do we need to wait to till November one to start making use of these in some form or fashion for our clients at their sentencing proceedings? Absolutely not. Uh, you can bring bring these to the attention of the court now, uh, because under uh, 3661, 18 U.S.C. 3661, court can consider anything. It's kind of a problem. It's a double edged sword. But here it, it works for uh, the uh, the defendant or the client. Uh, you can bring these to the attention of the court. And while the court isn't bound yet, I mean, the guidelines are advisory anyway, uh, but the court isn't bound in terms of how to apply the guidelines by these amendments yet. The court nonetheless can take into consideration what the commission is going to do. I mean, the yeah. commission is the expert at agency that was created by Congress to promulgate sentencing policy. And yep. so this would be you know, an obvious thing for uh, courts to take into consideration what the commission has decided to do. And, you know, and furthermore, uh, out of the 800 plus amendments since 1986 that have been uh, that the commission has promulgated with respect to the guidelines, you know, less than a dozen have uh, less than a half a dozen, if, if I recall correctly, less than six <laughs> have been uh, rejected by Congress. So the chances right. of these going through are quite high, although we will yeah. talk about the compassionate release one that, yeah. that did meet with some opposition. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And so I know some people are saying maybe I'll just try to continue my sentencing through past November. And that's one way to go, especially that if is. you, that you is. know, but but if you can't do that, right. um, yeah, start making yeah. use of these right now. That's a takeaway. Okay. True first offender. What do we got going on here? Okay, so true history. first offender. So here, what we're looking at, can you see the amendments here, the 11 amendments? I can. Okay, so the I highlighted the two that we're going to cover, and then we'll talk about acquitted conduct, which was a proposed amendment that they decided to punt, punt on. So let's talk about what I call the true first offender. This is my terminology that I've taken from uh, an old commission report uh, uh, over 10 years ago when the commission was looking at uh, first offenders and trying to, uh, back then, trying to figure out whether they would adopt a, a downward adjustment for true first offenders. And downward adjustments under the guidelines, by the way, are very rare. I mean, just about every adjustment is two levels up, four levels up, 15, 16 levels up if it's loss or drug amount or something like that. And so, you know, only yeah. very rarely do we have downward adjustments? Of course, we know about acceptance of responsibility. Yeah. Uh, most people that plead guilty get that, you know, two or three levels down. Uh, and then there's the, uh, you know, minor role adjustment, uh, which you generally see in drug cases, yeah. uh, which can be, you know, negative two, negative three, or negative four, you know, uh, levels down. There's, but outside I know of those, one. Well, wait. Yeah. Uh, okay. So lawful sporting purposes, there's a downward adjustment. Oh, that's adjustment true. Yes, the gun. yes, yes, yes. But these yeah, are not only do they, are they so rare in their appearance yeah. in the guidelines, they're rare in their application. Correct, correct. So, yeah, they're rare anyway. in their appearance. Well, ex ex except for acceptance of responsibility. Well, yeah, that, that's, one, that one's that, every that, that one's pretty common. But that's about it. You know, and, you know, out of the, I don't know, dozens, maybe hundreds of uh, upward adjustments under the guidelines, I mean, or adjustments under the guidelines, they're all up. You know, very, very few. The, the three that we mentioned go down. Yeah. So this is this is significant. Yeah. The, the point I'm making is this is significant. Now this is a new downward adjustment, and it's very significant not only because it's a new downward adjustment, and downward adjustments are rare, yeah. but it has the potential to apply to a lot of offenders. Yeah. So so let, let's take a look at it. There there are basically two components um, of this uh, of this amendment, and we're really going to talk about the the, the second one. The first one over here uh, called status points, it, it had to do with whether um, if, if you commit an offense uh, while you are under uh, uh, probation uh, or supervised release for another offense, yeah. you get additional By the way, points. Yeah. I, can I just interrupt and give sure. a tiny bit of background for people yes. who may be coming to this who still don't know what we're talking about, even though yes. we've done like 10 episodes on this, the the dehumanization process of the guidelines is and i'm holding this up if you're listening sorry but it reduces everything to a chart of numbers and on one axis is the offense uh levels conduct that's based on the crime that was committed and on the top is a criminal history category 
and those that's a points based system so anytime you've ever been convicted of a crime it could count for a point assessment zero one uh, one two or three points and um you add up those points and it gives you the criminal history category now notably up until now if you had zero points meaning you know nothing counted as criminal history which may or may not mean you've never been in trouble a day in your life you never got any real benefit for it you just didn't get the increase or the bump right. up in the criminal history category so this is what we're talking about now what kind of points uh system is in place and what are the changes so we're talking about status points first meaning if you've been on probation parole supervised release you were in historically got assessed two points which yep. automatically is bumping your criminal history category up one level right up one level. hopefully that was enough background right so so now and, and it's probably hard for your readers to to read this, uh, but what I have um, highlighted here for the status for the status points, um, what this amendment does is reduces the impact of status points by revising and redesignating subsection E to provide that one criminal history point is added if the defendant receives seven or more points under subsection A through D. In other words, what this is basically saying. Is your if you're in criminal history one or criminal history category two, you're not going to get an additional bump if you've committed this uh, particular offense while you're on probation or supervised release or some other type of um, judicial supervision uh, for some other offense. Yeah. So, um, okay. Good. So, yeah. So it's good. So it's good. So it basically re re reduces the impact of of that status. But at any rate. Um, that's what we're what we're the big focus here. It's this zero point offenders that I have uh, highlighted here, subsection B. And basically, what this says is if you have zero points, zero criminal history points, which means which generally means you have no criminal history, but it could also mean that you have no scorable criminal history because maybe your criminal history is just too old. It's, it was committed more than 10 years or 15 years ago, uh, depending on the type of offense. And uh, we'll, we'll spare your viewers all the intricacies of trying to figure out how, how to score criminal history points. But, some t but very often, uh, defendants um, will come before the court and have this. they will be first offenders. They've never committed an offense before of any kind, so they have zero criminal history points. And as you were just mentioning, that didn't mean anything. That didn't help any any offender. They they just uh, they didn't get tacked on. They did not receive additional points as if they did have criminal history. So now, what the commission decided to do is, if you are a true first offender, what I call it, you know, where you have zero criminal history points and you meet a bunch of criteria that we're going to go over in a second, then you are eligible for a downward adjustment of two levels. That's significant. That is very significant, Significant, not only because it can apply to a, a significant number of offenders, um, but it's going to really lower your uh, offense level. And generally, you know, most, as we know, most offenders, uh, they plead guilty. So they get that uh, two to three level downward adjustment already for pleading guilty. And now if they're a true first offender, which many are, especially in the white collar context, uh, uh, context, um, they're going to get another two levels down. So yeah. that's like a, a five level downward uh, adjustment right off the bat. Just to translate that into raw numbers, I mean, yes. it, it means two levels means different things depending on where on this chart you right. are. If you're low in the chart, it could mean a couple of months, uh, you know, down, down low. But if you're high in this chart, it could mean couple years of three years yeah, yeah. Could be years. so now here, here are the criteria um and if your readers can't read so uh, the first criteria criterion is you did not receive any criminal history points so like i was saying zero criminal history points mm -hmm. then the second was you're not a terrorist yeah. you didn't get Check. you didn't get the terrorism enhancement and that's frankly rarely applied so that's not a big one to, to worry about the third one is you didn't use any violence or credible th threats of violence and generally, you're you know you're not going to see that in white collar offenses, right? Um, a drug offense, or, or drug, yeah, drugs. but you, you sometimes a lot of immigration. You, you, yeah, some drugs. Yeah, drugs, immigration, 
and the... and and white collar you're not going to see it there's basically your violent offenses mm -hmm. so basically if you're a violent if you're if you're, if you're a first time violent offender forget about it you're not yeah. going to get you're not going to get this but the, uh but violent offenders are a very small category of uh federal offenders um so so we don't have to worry about them um the offense did not result in death or serious bodily injury uh so that that doesn't come up very often especially in, in white collar offenders white collar offenses immigration um or um uh drug drug offenses uh you might see this though one thing to look out for are those uh i know the uh, doj over the last several several years has been really picking up prosecution in the pill mill context yeah so sometimes those pill mill cases there will be an allegation of death or serious bodily injury right. not that the defendant directly caused it but that some patient down the road od'd on the the the, the prescription drugs yeah. or something like that so that's one thing that you know for uh health care white collar offenders they may need to watch out for this mm -hmm. so it's something to litigate of course yeah. is whether or not you know uh death or serious bodily injury resulted oops yeah. uh sex offenses uh, that's not going to apply, uh, which is a bit unfortunate, uh, because as you and I know, there are two different types of sex offenders. There's the, it, it, we won't get into this too deeply, but there's the lookers, the child pornography offenders, and then the touchers. Those are the ones that are actually engaged in trafficking or actual yeah. sexual assault and hands-on offenses. And perhaps the hands-on offenses make sense, uh, but the lookers, in my opinion, just the mm -hmm. child pornography straight up just look you know that that um that doesn't seem to that seems very arbitrary uh just well to, that begs the question these where are these terms defined because i notice even in the, the next one you're going to talk about the defendant did not personally cause substantial financial hardship so somewhere yeah. along the line we're going to want to know what these terms how these terms are defined so that we can right right, right. They they're, they're, they're they're ambiguously defined in the application notes and that's where litigation is going to be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so okay. there's going to be a lot of litigation about this stuff. Okay. Um, okay. So, so then, yes, the, you know, the, the defendant did not personally cause substantial financial hardship. Now, I like that, by the way, that personal uh, part of it, because under 2B1.1, um, which is where you find the financial hardship uh, uh, terminology, there is um, a, a, uh, a, an upward adjustment. Uh, if your your offense conduct, not necessarily you, but your offense conduct uh, caused substantial financial hardship to a victim. So let's say you're involved in a big Ponzi scheme, but you're a small player or something like that. Now, you personally did nothing uh, to cause substantial financial hardship to you know somebody down below you in that Ponzi scheme. But the Ponzi scheme itself did. You could get hit with an upward adjustment uh, for uh, the number of victims that suffered uh, uh, substantial financial hardship. But nonetheless, getting hit with that, the way I read this, the way I understand that, that personally uh, qualifier really means something. So you might get hit with an upward adjustment for causing, uh, for the offense conduct causing substantial financial hardship to a victim. But you personally, if you were not, the cause of that then you are still eligible all else being equal for this uh downward adjustment yeah. uh two levels then we have uh did not possess receive transport uh, a firearm so you know any firearms involved which generally you don't see in white collar or immigration or um your uh uh drug offenses well you sometimes see it but not not it's not very prominent uh so but yet you're a felon in possession. Uh, if it's a felon in possession case, you're pretty much ruled out from getting this, uh -huh. uh, from getting this downward uh, adjustment. Uh, okay. So the offense did, uh, it, is not covered by 2H1.1, uh, which is uh, offenses involving individual rights. So what that means in English is if you're a cop, mm. if you're a cop that violated uh, someone's civil rights criminally, a, and you're presumably a first offender because you're a police officer, you're not going to be eligible uh, for this. Okay. Um, and then finally, uh, the last two, defendant did not receive an adjustment for uh, hate crime 
you know, that, I guess that that, that kind of makes sense. The hate crime adjustment, though, is rarely, very rarely yeah. applied. It's one of those. Um, it's a rather, it's a unique uh, upward adjustment, but because it has to be found by beyond a reasonable doubt, it's the mm -hmm. only adjustment in the guidelines that require that has its own standalone uh, burden of proof. Uh, so it's rarely, rarely applied. And then serious human rights offenses, again, cops. Um, yeah, that that's really what that that applies to. And I, mm -hmm. frankly, I don't know how often I haven't looked. But 3A1.5, yeah. I'm sure, is also very rarely applied. So it's, that's not very significant. Uh, now, this this last one is significant, and it it is unfortunate, and it is something that I uh, that I wish the commission had not uh, uh, included because it really doesn't matter. It doesn't, you know, if you're a first, if you're a true first offender, uh, the way the these aggravated roles work. Um, that's just, you know, it's the role you played in, in the offense conduct, but because you may have had more culpability, why does it matter if you may have had more culpability as a manager versus somebody who wasn't a manager, but perhaps the fraud was much greater, you know, yeah. it, you know like over nine million dollars, nine and a half million dollars or something like that. Well, so guess what? I feel yeah. like I feel like that argument can be made for several of these exceptions because sure. like credible threats of violence or somebody gets death or serious bodily injury like i'm sorry that's a bad fact it's going to be accounted for in other places in the guidelines yeah. but if you're a first offender you're a first offender right it shouldn't it's to me it shouldn't really sure. even no, matter you're, what you're, your you're, crime you're, is. you're 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 absolutely right but but what i've been trying to emphasize those are political well, carve outs is what those yeah, are yeah i agree they, they are political carve outs but as i've been trying to articulate though is a lot of these criteria are, 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 are almost um, immaterial because they're rarely applied, like yeah. the, the, the hate crime enhancement or the serious bodily injury, you know, right. all, all these other, uh, all, all these criteria that, these exclusive criteria, the criteria that would exclude you from this downward adjustment, they're rarely applied. But this last one isn't. And this is the role in the offense conduct and this can ha this applies to any type of offense, whether it's white collar, sex offense, immigration, drugs, what have you. Yep. And uh, okay. th there, there are basically three. There are three types of roles one can play. You can basically uh, be a supervi supervisor. You could be a manager, or you could be a leader. Yeah. And that's a plus two, plus three, or plus four, uh, in terms of the uh, what the upward enhancement would be. Yeah. Any one of those, any if any one of those apply, then you're not going to get the downward adjustment. So you could be a true first offender that happened to be a supervisor and meeting that burden of determining who's a supervisor in a conspiracy is very low. It's just a preponderance of the evidence. And it's it's more art than it is science in terms of how uh, courts view someone as a supervisor or a manager. Leaders tend to be easier to determine. Um, because it's kind of obvious who, who the leader is, given the instructions, coming up with the idea and all this other stuff. But stuff like supervisor and manager is uh, susceptible to very arbitrary designations, oh. as opposed to not being a, 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 a supervisor or a manager. Uh, and so those are, that arbitrariness, I'm afraid, is going to preclude many first-time offenders from getting this they, that they otherwise should be eligible for. So let me ask you a question about this, because I, I just assume by the language true first offender, you know that yeah. sometimes people have prior convictions on their record, but they don't count for any criminal history points, either because right. they're too old or because of right. the nature of the thing. So can you have those old priors yes. that don't count for points, but still be a true first offender under yes. these guidelines? Okay. Yes. Again, true first offender is my terminology. Really, what the what what this downward adjustment okay. is, if you if you think about it, is a um, is a minor offender, for lack of a better term, because they don't have to be a first time offender, uh, but they they have to be a minor nonviolent offender, and I say minor because uh, or or uh, they have to be offender that wasn't involved in a conspiracy, uh, minor or non conspiratorial offender 
because they don't have to have they, they don't have to be true first offenders. They they could have had prior conduct or co contact with law enforcement. It's just that their contact was not scorable. Okay. Uh, they just they just can't have uh, a rolling offense adjustment. Yeah. Good. Is there anything else on um first offenders that we want to talk about? No. This is a... that, that, I'm I'm glad the commission. Uh, and, and by the way, what, I, I will say this though: if your client doesn't meet all these criteria, still argue for it, because just because you know he you know if he one out of let's say he has the supervisor role, but otherwise meets everything, nonetheless argue for this as a downward variance like judge look you know just because he doesn't meet one maybe that you know you can't you can't adjust it downward under the guidelines but still grounds for a variance because the po whole whole point of this is to recognize that you know first offenders first offenders of this nature yeah. even though they might not be true first offenders but offenders of this nature uh, largely are not as culpable they do not recidivate uh, as much as you know, they have a significantly lower recidivism rate than even those with just one criminal history point. So mm -hmm. the point simply is, is that they don't, they either don't need prison, or they don't need it as, as long. And just because they don't meet one or two of these criteria, shouldn't automatically preclude them from at least a downward mm -hmm. variance. Okay, good. And I, so I guarantee anybody who's listening to this who has a charge or who's representing is has this um i mean they need to look at this because they could get some use out of this right now don't wait till november one like we said Correct. all right so now so that is i would say that might qualify as a seismic shift but this next one is another one that's ra gonna rattle the the ground beneath the feet of this our is a seismic clients shift. who this are is a currently shift. incarcerated in the federal bureau of prisons yes, yes. So we're going to spend a lot of time on what they're calling compassionate release and what we'll talk about. Maybe we need to call something else from now on, but I'll, yeah. we'll get there too. But well, you ahead. know, that, that, that did come up in the, um, I'm sorry, that, that did come up during the hearings about whether, you know, compassionate release is a, the, the proper nomenclature for this. I mean, I frankly, I think it's splitting hairs. It is it, 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 part of the reason why they brought that up is because some of the criteria for granting comp compassionate release now, at least the, the criteria that we're going to go through, may not seem at least uh, obviously have to do with anything with compassion, like a change in law. Yeah. But uh, I, I would argue that it, that it still does. But nonetheless, look, this is the nomenclature that we've been using. Uh, compassionate release. Um, well, let, let me back up for a sec. Compassionate release. This this part of um, uh, of the uh, federal criminal code has been with us since the origination of the guidelines since 1986. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, what many people forget is uh, 28 USC 994, which is specific to the Sentencing Commission. At, uh, 28 USC 994 outlines all the duties of the sentencing commission and sub t specific and this has been the case since 19 1984 specifically references compassionate release or the statute that we call compassionate release 3582 c1a mm -hmm. and what it says what what congress told the commission to do congress told the commission when it created the commission and when it created compassionate release that the commission shall describe what should be considered extraordinary and compelling reasons for sentence reduction. And this is significant because we're going to get in, we'll, we'll discuss in a little bit, um, the three commissioners that objected to this this new amendment to compassionate release uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the uh, commission passed yesterday. Yeah. So at any rate, so, so just a, a quick history on compassionate release. Compassionate release has always been there. Basically, what it was historically, uh, was when uh, a defendant had served a significant amount of time already, like uh, over 30 years in prison, and they were elderly, you know, uh, they were served over, I think it was like over 30 years, and they were over 75 years of age. Um, the warden of his, uh, of the prisoner's prison could um, ask the sentencing judge, petition the sentencing judge to shorten the 
uh, the inmate's sentence and allow him to leave. He, he's already served a ton of time, Judge. He's been a model inmate, and he's old. We don't want him to die here. It costs us money. We don't want to deal with that. So that was one por por uh, part of compassionate release. The other was if the inmate was dying of a terminal illness, stage four cancer, and you know he had six months or less to live, then uh, that's something else the warden could do is ask the court, hey, look, let's let's um, let's let him out, let's let him die at home, because frankly, we don't want him to die here. It's very expensive. We don't want to deal with all that crap. Let's just, just, let's just let him out. And then the last the the last traditional criteria criterion for compassionate release is if the uh, the inmate had minor children on the outside and there was no longer anybody uh, to look after the children. Uh, a spouse had died or left uh, and there was no other family members to take care of the children. And the, the inmate was the only one that could take care of the children. And the inmate had also served a significant amount of time and had been a model inmate and all this other stuff. Then the warden and only the warden could ask the uh, sentencing judge for, to less the sentence. That rarely happened. And even though compassionate release has always been there by statute, um, uh, but not always in the guidelines, I'll get to that in a second, but it's always been there by statute. It was uh, wardens rarely, rarely, rarely applied for it. Even in the most egregious and obvious situation, we had an elderly inmate who was dying of cancer. They just let him die in the BOP and uh, wouldn't uh, 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 lobby the or petition the sentencing judge to allow him to come out. So what what ended up happening is right before the pandemic, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Trump administration passed the First Step Act or the CARES Act or in the First Step Act, and uh, part of that act uh, uh, allowed for the first time inmates themselves could now petition courts directly for compassionate release um, if they met these traditional criteria. Uh, the only thing they had to do, the only catch was they still had to first ask the, ask the warden for, hey, warden, can you petition for my compassionate release? And if the warden did nothing after 30 days, then the inmate could go in and petition directly the, the yeah. sentence. But that, but that had to do primarily with uh the inmate was only able to do that under those three cri criteria that i just mentioned um and yeah. then uh th then what so what the what so what happened was the first step act passes now allows inmates to petition courts for compassionate release yeah. but there is no commission at the time when this passes there were no commissioners so the, uh, the the provision in the guidelines that has to do with compassionate release was not updated to now account for uh, uh, inmates that could petition courts directly. And it was still written under the old law where it was written like it, where it only applied to wardens. And it had the um, criteria in there for wardens, what criteria a warden would consider in petitioning uh, for compassionate release on, perhaps, on behalf of an inmate. So what, what ended up happening is once the First Step Act happens, no commission to change the guidelines or update the guidelines, then the pandemic hits and holy hell breaks loose because now everybody wants the hell out uh, because yeah. we're going to die or we're going to suffer uh, lifelong injuries and severe consequences from COVID-19. We're in a prison. They can't protect us from this, blah, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And they're not giving us the right vaccines or quick enough and you know all, all this other stuff. And you and I have talked about this uh, before. So what, what ended up happening is um, uh, the case law, all, pretty much all courts said the way the, gui the guidelines are written right now, the way they apply to compassionate release, we're going to ignore those because those are, they, they were written for a, a time prior to the First Step Act. Mm -hmm. And so they're no longer applicable. So now any reason any reason, not just whether they've been in there a long time or they're dying from terminal disease or there's no one to take care of their kid. We can come up with any reason to grant compassionate release because we're not bound by the uh, these old guidelines. They're no longer applicable. Every circuit went that way except one in the 11th circuit. They were, they were the only outlier that said, no, 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 no. We still have to apply uh, the guidelines as they were written. Mm -hmm. uh, so at any rate, 
the good thing is the commission decided to uh, uh, promulgate and to to finally address this issue. And it was the first time they could. <clears throat> so they developed criteria now. They came in and updated the guideline, uh, which is 1B1.13. Uh, yeah. It applies to compassionate release. And they updated it and provided, provided new criteria for that. But one thing I want, I, I think it's also worth noting as well, 28 USC 994T has always been there and has always given the commission the authority to come up with what constitutes extraordinary and compelling reasons. And it doesn't need to be limited to, you know, those three. Um, it wasn't until 19 or till, until 2006, over 20 years after the guidelines were promulgated, that uh, the commission finally got around to creating 1B, uh, 1B1.13. And that was an amendment uh, 683. This is just uh, for the guidelines nerds out there. I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that people were aware of this. That first of all, uh, yeah, again, compassionate release has always been there. Uh, the commission didn't even bother addressing it until 2006. And then nobody really took advantage of it. The, 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 um, the wardens in the Bureau of Prisons were not taking advantage of it at all, which is what part of the impetus for the First Step Act so that let's get let's now allow inmates to do it so we can we can really take full you know uh, full effect of this compassionate release because this is what Congress created you know no one's using it it's you yeah. know let, let's do it and so now <clears throat> now we have the um the compassionate release uh a criteria so basically what what it comes down to now this new 1b 1.3 what you see here, and this might be hard to see, but your readers can go to the, your link and you know, pull this down or just go to the commission's website and they can pull down these um, uh, reader friendly amendments. Everything in pink is the, the new stuff yeah. uh, that has that has been added. So just to just to go, go through this quickly. So there's still the old criteria here. If you look under B1, can you see my cursor circling around here? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's medical circumstances. We talked about that. That's a uh, a classical one. Um, uh, and what's interesting though here is C. The defendant is suffering from a medical condition that requires long term or specialized medical care that is not being provided and without which the defendant is at risk of serious deterioration in health or death. Now, Doug, you, you, you'll recall when we spoke about compassionate release, or actually not compassionate release. When we spoke about COVID-19 and did a review uh, a few weeks ago about how awful uh, the BOP has done with respect to COVID. And by yeah. the way, in the, since, since we did that podcast, uh, the DOJ's Office of Inspector General has issued a report uh, corroborating everything we said, mm -hmm. everything we said. Mm -hmm. It was just absolute disaster, blah, 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 blah. So at any rate, um, what this sub C has to do with here, as we discussed, is long COVID. So this is uh, suffering from medical conditions that require long-term or specialized medical care. Now, it says it's not limited to long COVID, but that's the impetus for this. Is now we have all these inmates now, just about every inmate, as we discussed back then, just about every inmate that's currently housed within the Bureau of Prisons has been infected uh, by COVID-19. And yeah. as we know, at least as we know, as CDC reports and many peer-reviewed articles across the world reported 30% of people that have been infected with COVID-19 suffer long COVID. And that can be very serious stuff from killing your brain cells to ruining your lungs and your heart and all this other stuff. So this now is a ground for compassionate release uh, under the medical circumstances. If they're suffering from something that's long-term, that you know, the the uh, BOP can't deal with. And we know the BOP can't deal with it because hospitals can't deal with it. Yeah. Nobody knows uh, you know, how, how how to address long COVID right now. We're yeah. we're we're all flying blind in, in this war new yeah. post COVID or not post COVID world, but right. this pandemic and, world. And and yeah. by the way, and it may be obvious, but I can think of other scenarios outside of long COVID. Oh yes. Where you could definitely raise this um where, you know, person needs specific medication it's off formulary the bop isn't giving them the right meds or they're not giving them regular 
care and that sort of thing. So AIDS. Uh, yeah, <laughs> AIDS. Yeah. 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 AIDS is very common. Can be a sure. this awful job, you know, and, and other types of illnesses and mm -hmm. you know cancers and also or all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. So then D here. You know, it's uh, also interesting, uh, though, because we talked about this on our last podcast, the BOP standard responses. Yeah. We're awesome. We're right. great at treating this stuff. We got this. Don't worry. And isn't this sort of at least an implicit recognition that that's bullshit? And we know right. that's bullshit, because right. if it were true, there wouldn't be any need for this provision. Right. So, well, and and to to. uh well, to corroborate what you just said, <laughs> if we look at D, it, it, it speaking more to the bullshit of BOP's uh, default, we can handle this. Because here in, in subsection D, talks about yeah, another reason why you can grant compassionate release if the defendant is housed in a correctional facility that's affected or doesn't even need to be affected at imminent risk of being infected by an ongoing outbreak of an infectious disease or an ongoing public health emergency declared by the appropriate federal or state authority. So it just has to be um, at risk of being uh, affected by an ongoing outbreak of an infectious disease. Mm -hmm. um, and th it doesn't even say that it has to, uh, that it can handle it. Um, it well, it does. It says that such ri risk, I'm sorry. So it, uh, there's three, three criteria here. So the first criteria, right. So the first criteria is housed at a correctional facility um, that is at imminent risk of being, uh, getting infected. And then subsection two is due to personal health risk, uh, factors and custodial status. The, de the defendant is at increased risk of suffering severe medical complications. And for those that are listening, go to the CDC's website. It lists all the comorbidities for COVID-19. Basically a comorbidity is a, uh, uh, it, it is a variable or it's basically a status or some type of health ailment that your uh, client may have that would constitute uh, providing increased risk of suffering a severe medical complication or death from COVID. But you know, again, it could be, this isn't limited to COVID. It could be anything, cancer, some other type of infectious disease, uh, what have you. But COVID uh, obviously uh, in the pandemic uh, has put this at the at the forefront. So basically, if the defendant suffers from a comorbidity for a particular infectious disease that the facility is at imminent risk of getting infected of, uh, he he or she may qualify now for compassionate release, provided that such risk and this is the third criteria such such risk cannot be adequately mitigated in a timely manner. And of course. Of course, by definition, we know this because at, at any literature that you look at that that discusses infectious diseases always identifies prisons, uh, nursing homes, schools, yeah. wherever where dormitories, anywhere there's a lot of people in close proximity for a long period of time. Those are the powder kegs for uh, infectious diseases. And you cannot mitigate the risk. The only way to mitigate the risk, and there literally are thousands of peer-reviewed articles on this uh, that you can go on a Google Scholar and find them or just Google around. But there are thousands of peer-reviewed articles on this that discuss that the only way to mitigate the risk of spreading an infectious disease within a prison or a jail is by decreasing the population. That is the only way to do it, period. Yep. So this is nice. the, the, the I'm I'm glad that they they added this in here, mm -hmm. and then we'll skip to, here to uh, the age of the defendant here number two, that's the classic one that that's still in there. Family circumstances that's also a classic one, uh, that that's still in there. They've added a few additional uh, uh, criteria for it, kind of opening opening that up. Um, and I want to kind of in the interest of time, um, I'm going to go through these real quick. Uh, number four here is victim of abuse. I like this. If the defendant, while in custody serving the term of imprisonment, uh, was a victim of sexual abuse involving a sexual act, uh, regardless of the age of the victim or, sorry, down here, um, that was committed by a or at the direction of a correctional officer, 
they can be they can qualify for compassionate release. And as we know, and as we've been hearing, uh, you know, there have been facilities um, such as FCI Dublin out in California that has had a notorious amount of prison rapes that have been going on there by uh, male staff against female staff. Yeah. So that's what this is meant to. to And by the way, and I know we were not talking about every single amendment, but there is a corollary uh, amendment that was passed that I do think is worth mentioning, which is they, they changed the guideline for criminal sexual abuse of a ward. And I think this is a direct response to those problems they were having with guards having sexual uh, sexually abusing their inmates and what but what I did found find to be a little interesting it was a base offense level of 14 they kicked it up to an 18 um mm-hmm. but if you look at eight level 18 you know it's 27 to 33 months now there is a cross reference to criminal sexual abuse so I think arguably that means if it's like a forcible sexual mm-hmm. assault then it's going to be more serious. But so this is a guideline that they decided maybe if it's quote unquote consensual. But to me, um, you know, and I'm thinking I'm going to call this the orange is a new black um, porn stash amendment, you know, where a guard has a quote unquote, again, I'm saying quote unquote consensual relationship because they're an inmate. And fundamentally, I think to to just say, oh, this is a 27 to 33 month offense. Look, I'm all in favor of lower sentences for crimes but i i feel like there's something kind of gross about that it that it fundamentally ignores the power dynamic and the responsibility that's placed on guards and bop maybe i'm just hypersensitive because i've seen how badly things can go wrong in the bop in general but my attitude is if you're a guard and you are placed in the trust to to care for um you know for the safety and well-being of an inmate Mm -hmm. and you have sex with them yeah. Under any circumstances, I kind of feel like a couple of years in jail might not be co- quite exactly the kind of deterrence that people are looking. I don't know. It's weird for me for to be a criminal defense lawyer to be talking about that. Maybe that's my inherent bias against the BOP and in the 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 carceral state in general. But but that's that's a little fucking weird to me. But anyway, yeah. I digress. Um, go back, go back. We're but we're we're still on compassionate release. Yeah, we're still on compassionate release. And I, and I do hate that name. And I do feel like I know you say it is, it's a term of art and everything else, but you know, my deal, words matter, and we're telling stories here. And yeah, that's, that's, that story to me is an old story. It's an ancient story. This is a bygone era where we had these couple of things that if you're on your death's doorstep, we're gonna have some compassion for you and really why isn't this compassion? Why isn't the fact that you've been raped by the warden? Um, yeah, that's, that's compassion. This is, that fits there, but I'm just saying in general, like, you know, why um, isn't it compassion if, you know, you're looking at COVID-19 or COVID-23, you know, 23, for God's sake, who knows what it is now, you know, some other, you know, you're you're sitting in there in this powder keg and they're, they're, they're handing you rags instead of KN95s. And they're yeah. not vaccinating the population and they're not giving boosters and all this stuff. <laughs> and, you know, that's that's compassion, too. OK, all right. I guess I have that scene from Midnight Express playing in my head where yeah. the guy is, is on there for the resentencing and he flips out in court and he screams at the prosecutor. I wish you would have mercy. And that's like asking a bear to shit in a toilet. Um, <laughs> I just feel like. I don't know, man. Okay, whatever. We can move on. I, I, too many digressions. I think there's a better word that we can use for that. But I, I will say this. I don't like extraordinary and compelling either because those words make it seem like such a high bar that this is extraordinary, some some kind of extraordinary and compelling situation. So I'm going to have to give that some thought. We can move on from from that but but well, I, I, what my else? my retort my retort and I agree with you I I agree yeah. I, I agree with you but what I would say is what DOJ says is extraordinary compelling basically means rarely happens and I can agree <laughs> with that rarely happens but what's the context of rare we are in a situation right now where everything is rare with this covid-19 and it, the the pandemic still raging throughout the Bureau of Prisons. Inmates are still dying. Inmates are still getting infected. And the BOP is not doing any testing. And we still have long COVID to deal with. 
for the whole world. And we don't know what's going to happen in the next three or yeah. four years. We yeah. are in a situation now where everything is rare, is extraordinary and compelling. We mm -hmm. are living in extraordinary times. That's my retort to them. Okay. Well, I and like it. Okay. I like it. And the true beauty of this is it used to be a very, very, very narrow thing. And right. this expands it on several grounds. So let's right. keep going. What right. what else are the some of the possible grounds we could so argue so what one of the so number five here as we're looking is other reasons. This is kind of just a catch all. There could be it and and so uh the the commission is purposefully leaving the reason that whatever what constitutes extraordinary and compelling to the courts. And that's great because we can't see down the road what you know nobody saw covid-19 coming you know not we're not going to see the effects of long covid for 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 quite some time you know we're we're not going to know what's going on you know with the overpopulation and the growing overpopulation of the the BOP how that's going to affect inmates and how that's going to affect uh the ability to protect them and house them safely and provide health care so there's all these unknowns out there, uh, and and I'm glad that the commission had the foresight to put this uh, catch-all in there, so we're not limited to just three artificial ones, and that and anything could be uh, uh, extraordinary and compelling. But this sixth one, I love. I'm a little disappointed in, in one regard, but 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 I love it. And this has to do, and, and this is another extraordinary, compelling, and compassionate thing: change in law. So, you know, you might be in uh, prison right now uh, serving two consecutive mandatories for 15 years for some gun offense or something like that. Congress comes along, changes the law, doesn't make it retroactive. But if you had been sentenced today, you know, you would only be serving 15 years because they change the law and they say these two mandatories now could be imposed uh, concurrently. So and, and these are real world examples that many judges, many courts and appellate courts, even Ninth Circuit, for example, have approved as when there's been a change in law that courts can take that into consideration uh, for granting compassionate release. And that's what the commission um, has uh, placed here. When there's an unusually long sentence um, and the defendant has served at least 10 years, I don't really like that because that seems an artificial break. I mean, a 10 year, 10 year sentence itself could be unusually long compared to to everybody else. So that's you know that that seems to say that anybody serving at least ten years by definition is not an unusually long sentence. Um, so th that's something that I hope the commission will readdress and reconsider down the road. But nonetheless, if it's an unusually long sentence, they may be able to um, uh, uh, use that as a ground for compassionate release. But of course, now this begs the question of what is an unusually long sentence and how is that defined? And the commission doesn't okay. say, but of course. But that's course, where you that, come in, man. That's where I come in. <laughs> this is where I come statistics, in. Statistics, baby. Exactly. This is all about statistics and data. You want to know what an unusually long sentence is? I can tell you what an unusually long sentence is. And very often, as you and I have discovered some of the cases we've worked on, uh, it, it, some of these cases, there will very often be a defendant that receives the longest sentence ever. Mm -hmm. Longest sentence ever. We've had ever those cases. For somebody. Yeah. We've had several of those for those that for people that are similarly situated. To them. But nobody and, knows that. And just F F FYI, the, the, those sentences didn't happen on our watch. We got this yeah, case no, no, no. after we they in, got sentenced. We come into, yes, we come um, in to clean up. Yes, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> but right. Just, just, you know, that's an important thing. You know, this change in law thing is is a little bit tricky, though, because there's two paragraph two two changes back to back. And the next one is, I'm sure you're going to talk about, limitation on changes in law. Which yeah. means you really can't argue change in law unless you have some other grounds to argue first along with it. Then you can yeah. consider changes in law. Is that I'm that's right. how I'm that, reading that's it. But see, that but, but th that's what I like about this limitation uh, of changes in law, except as provided in 6B, which is then usually long sentence, a change in law uh, that has not been made retroactive shall not be considered for purposes of determining extraordinary compelling reasons under the however if a defendant otherwise establishes the extraordinary compelling reasons warrant a sentence reduction under this policy statement 
a change okay. in the law. Okay, uh, so including maybe consider now. I wait, I'm sorry, just interrupt yeah. here. I don't read that to have the ten year limitation on there. So what I read this this limitation on change in law actually is not a limitation. It opens it up because you don't have to have this ten years. You, you don't have to have served ten years. You can come in and say my sentence is very unusual, and yeah. that is part of my argument for why it's extraordinary and compel why there's extraordinary and compelling reasons. I have. I got a usually long sentence. They can't protect me from COVID or AIDS or whatever virus du, du jour there is, uh, you know, and all these other factors. And I have this medical condition. I have diabetes and da, 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 da. Now, all of that together, and I don't have to have been in for 10 years. I could have been in for three. And maybe I got a five-year sentence, and that's unusually long for somebody like me. I was the only just, one that ever got okay, an upward so departure. I, I think his the careful reading probably solves the question because I think – it says, you know, except for in B6. So basically, if you're talking just about an unusually long sentence, yeah. change in law is fair game, right? That That's what that's saying. You can argue change. Change in law. in law is fair game, provided you've served at least 10 years. Provided you served at least 10 years. Now, yeah. um, but it doesn't have to be a change in law for you to argue unusually long sentence, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. That could come in other reasons. You can always argue unusually long sentence. Okay. That's another. That's other reasons. Okay. okay. So I haven't served ten years, but you know I have an unusually long sentence, and you know I have all these other reasons. You know, okay. you just can't do this as a standalone. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So good. Uh, I like that. I like that. And so I think what they're trying to do though is limit the floodgates here on that change in law thing because. Um, it says including amendments to the guidelines. So like if they do this true criminal, zero criminal history amendment, they're saying, well, you know, that doesn't open the floodgates for everybody to come back to well, court. Including, and try an to amendment, get to including an amendment that has not been made retroactive. Uh, will that one be, that one will not be made retroactive though, right? The the criminal history amendment. Uh. Correct. Yeah, it, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was not. So, yes. That, that's and so not, what that. So the way I read that is, you couldn't just say, "Okay, now they changed those guidelines. I want back in for my two, two levels off." But that if you have other grounds, um, that you can, uh, raise that two level. You could. Right. Bring well, that that's up. that's that's the second sentence. However, mm -hmm. if a defendant otherwise establishes. That extraordinary, compelling reasons warrant a sentence reduction under yeah. this policy statement. A change in the law, including an amendment to the guidelines that has not been made retroactive, yeah. may be considered. So right. you can come in. That, that's where you can get the the uh, downward adjust the two level downward adjustment for first offender. Yeah. So get your foot in the door, figure out a grounds yeah. that exist, and then you can raise all these other issues, which is great. And here, here's a ground that's always going to apply. There is no facility that can save any inmate or protect any inmate from any type of infectious disease. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And this we is got huge. and we got them floating around all the freaking time. This Go is huge. Website, huge. Yes. Um, huge. Okay, so more last one is just yeah, just last one is rehabilitation. Yeah, uh, here in D. Uh, rehabilitation of the defendant while serving the sentence may be considered in combination with other circumstances. Uh -huh. So, you know, so that's good. So that's why it's always important to get your, your, your clients, um, uh, basic, what's the term I'm, I'm blinking out here, Doug, the, um, transcript of the, uh, all the work, uh, he or she has done, all the courses he or she has done, you know, and any, any recidivism. Yeah. Yeah, any disciplinary write-ups, yeah. hopefully no discipline. And no disciplinary, right, uh -huh, exactly. Uh -huh. I love it. Now, yeah. here's the political bent that we got to talk about, and it's so interesting because, and we, we alluded to this at the beginning, but let me set it up. So I think there are 11 amendments that, are, um, that receive approval. There's only one that did not receive unanimous support of the months yes. that were approved. And well, that's this. It's that's this one. one, and it's yes. this one, and yes. it's divided along party lines. So there's four Democratic appointees on the commission that voted yes, and there's three Republicans that vote 
No, which means yeah. the next stop is Congress. And that w does concern me because even though you said Congress never, ever, ever shoots these down, we're in such a new, highly partisan <laughs> uh, era of our politics that I'm concerned that this might be the the one. Um, so and, everybody, and... everybody read, watching this right now. Yeah. Copy this statute. Send this to your congressman. Send this to the, your senator and remind them that Congress told the commission to come up with reasons that constitute extraordinary and compelling. Yeah, that these three, these three, uh, the 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 three uh, commissioners that voted against this, the way I understood them when I was listening to them yesterday, uh, was they forgot about this. They they were they were talking as if the commission was acting ultra vires outside of its authority yes. uh, uh, to to uh, impose this. The commission was given this since the beginning of the commission. Well, and do. here's that's a great if this is so this is a great action item. And I will put this in the show notes and I'll even draft some language for anyone who wants to go there and copy yeah. and paste to send emails to your yeah. um, house and Senate because um, this matters. But 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 listen, you know, I was looking at the the opening remarks from mm -hmm. uh, the chair, Carlton yeah. Reeves. And do you yeah. know what he says? Today, we are listening to Congress and the public by increasing first steps toward second chances. And, and, and he goes on to say, during the pandemic, federal judges saved lives using their authority uh, under this statute to reduce yep. sentences for incarcerated people facing, quote, extraordinary and compelling circumstances like certain risks posed by COVID-19. And then he says, and this I think is also very important, responding to the First Step Act's directive to increase the use and transparency yes. of this tool, the commission updated its guidelines to reflect lessons learned since the pandemic, ensure judges can continue to take first steps towards second chances for those who deserve them, and reunite families through appropriate re entry judges are in the best position to decide if someone deserves to have the length of their sentence revisited said chair reeves this policy trusts courts to continue doing what is right so he over and over mentions the first step act mm -hmm. and who's who created the first step act it was under <laughs> it, yeah but but what administration That's Trump administration right right so i don't understand where the politics are because this was a republican born legislation that created the first step act that chairman reeves is constantly invoking in these comments so when we for those of you on the on the i assume the pushback is going to be on the republican side but i don't know that for sure i'm just making stupid assumptions but you have the ammunition to say this was your baby and it was a beautiful baby and you need to own it and take pride in it and keep it keep it going you republicans if you stand in the way of this now um, you're spitting in the face of Donald Trump. Yeah. And nobody would ever want to willingly spit in the face of Donald Trump, <laughs> especially except not Melania. the Republicans. <laughs> yeah, except Melania. Right. except Melania, yeah. Stormy Daniels, and any Republican. Yeah. So, and definitely call Lindsey Graham because I just saw him on Fox News and he's got the Trump haircut, the Trump dyed and the Trump tan now. So he is like essentially Donald Trump incarnate. And so we want to make sure Lindsey's really on board with this. So, um, yeah, I'm going to put this. If you go to www.sentencingstats, uh, that's Mark's website. Definitely go to www.sentencingstats.com um, because he can tell you about... Um, unusually long sentences uh, with his sentencing stats. But if you go to www.setforsentencing.com under this episode and you look in the show notes, I promise you, I'm going to draft you a little bit of language. And I do want you to reach out to your, to your house, your Senate, and make sure they understand this is deeply important and there should be no reason to have this partisan divide. So now we've covered the two amazing seismic uh, shifts of positive changes that we hope will be in law by November 1. We did a very uh, long, well, all of our podcasts are long together, but we did a pretty in-depth podcast with Professor 
Doug Berman from the Ohio State University School of Law, the Moritz College of Law, and um, all about acquitted conduct, because this is a huge deal. And yes. it's been haunting and plaguing us uh, since the guy the inception of the guidelines. And we had a lot of hope. And there are a lot of cases percolating up to the Supreme Court. And this this amendment was on the table with the commission. We had a lot of hope that there'd be some change from the commission. And uh, it didn't happen. Do you yeah. like that sound effect, by the way? Yeah, that was we're very, now into that, high that tech. Awesome. I just yeah. I just made a, a, a very a, very analog. <laughs> okay, thank you. Tell us about tell us about so, the bummer. The bummer. So the bummer is, and you know, there's all sorts of theories about why why they punted, um, but I'm not sure if it was uh, political. Frankly, um, I think it was more logistical uh, because right now, as we discussed, the Supreme Court is considering at least seven petitions for cert addressing. The use of acquitted conduct at sentencing, yeah. Uh, and as we discussed in our um, in, in our podcast on this with uh, Professor Berman, um, if acquitted conduct goes, as the government in one of its briefs in opposition to cert noted, if acquitted conduct goes, so too does uh, dismissed conduct and uncharged conduct, which is huge. Because that pretty much is almost all of relevant conduct. It's not all relevant conduct. And relevant conduct is the universe of conduct that the courts look at when they're applying the sentencing guidelines. Yeah. And they include both elements of the offense uh, as well as non-elements, what we call sentencing factors. So, for example, um, you know, if somebody defrauded uh, somebody of money, uh, that, that act of defrauding uh, is an element of the, the offense of, like, say, wire fraud. Uh, but the amount of money that was defrauded or stolen is not an element, and that would be considered a sentencing factor. And, you know, same with uh, drugs and uh, the drug amount, unless it's triggering a, a mandatory minimum. And that's a different different issue. Uh, at, at, at any rate, so um, there, because the commission cannot make cannot dictate to judges what uh, they can or cannot consider from a constitutional perspective, and only the Supreme Court can, my guess is that at the end of the day, they were getting so much uh, feedback, not just from those that said, don't pass it, which was basically the government, you know, keep acquitted conduct for whatever reason, but all the nuances that you and I and Professor Berman had discussed, uh, they were getting a lot of feedback on that, and they were probably reading the uh, the, uh, the petitions and opposition to cert that the government had filed in all these uh, uh, acquitted conduct cases. And they probably decided, you know what, let's sit back and let's let the uh, Supreme Court see, see what the Supreme Court's going to do. And then we can go go from there, which, frankly, I think is the smarter move. And 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 um, uh, uh, Chair Reeves yesterday, this is part of his statement that he gave at the beginning of the um, of the hearing. Uh, he kind of alludes to this. He said, we received an immense amount of comment on our proposals regarding acquitted conduct sentencing. Some asked us to preserve judges ability to consider acquitted conduct. Well, some the government. Uh, some asked us to move forward with the proposal to significantly limit how judges can use such conduct, basically that everybody that believes that uh, the presumption of innocence actually means something. <laughs> and many other many others wanted us to go bolder, me, <laughs> uh, either by banning any consideration of acquitted conduct when using the guidelines or addressing other forms, other forms of conduct judges can currently consider. So these conduct these, these comments affirm to the commissioner the, the commissioners that the question of what conduct can judges when uh, consider when using the guidelines is as Professor Berman has said of foundational and fundamental importance to the operation of the entire federal justice system. So nice shout out to Professor Berman there. Uh, mm -hmm. We all I wish they would have uh, cited our podcast though. Uh, mm -hmm. We all agreed <laughs> that the commission needs a little more time before coming to a final decision on such an important matter, we tend to resolve questions about acquitted conduct next year. So um, they're punting on this, but you know, I was initially really upset and because uh, you know this has been sitting out there for so long. It's such an easy thing to resolve, 
uh, because it shouldn't be considered at all ever because presumption of innocence. Um, and there's so many Supreme Court justices, uh, you know, that seem to be on board with this. Yeah. That once you consider that, then, it, you know, it kind of makes sense. Yes. You know, let's let's sit back and because because they can only do a partial fix and this partial fix might make whatever the Supreme Court does a disaster. Who knows? So right. it's better to let the Supreme Court go first. And the funny thing is, I think the Supreme Court has been waiting to see what the commission was going to do. Yeah, because they've, they've, the they've been the kicking the can too. They've been kicking the can too. They've been saying, right. you know, the, the lead petition, United States versus McClinton, that was filed in early March of 2022. It's mm -hmm. been sitting around for over a year. And, and so, so, so Supreme yeah. Court, the ball yeah. is in your court, literally. The, the ball's in their court. And, and I think that the the next time they're going to issue orders is on April 17th. So hopefully, yeah, you know, now they could, I guess, next Monday, but from what I understand, they're not going to issue any orders on a next Monday because of the holiday. Mm -hmm. So uh, April 17th is the, which, which I think is going to be the date this podcast airs because Monday is part two of the autism podcast. So it might be the day the podcast dropped that they're going to, we're going to know if they do this. So that's interesting. And, yeah. and then I guess the question is what can we do to influence the court, because apparently for over 20 years, Justice Thomas has been allegedly been treated to um, luxury vacations by a billionaire Republican donor. So, I mean, all we got to do is get him out on one of these trips on a private yeah. jet and maybe just talk, tell him how important this issue is. I don't know. Well, I, I could probably I could afford a martini at the old Abbott. That's about it. <laughs> Um, well then I, I guess I'm we'll just, <laughs> just gonna have to wait and see what happens then because I'm I'm with you. I can't I don't have access to a private jet. Yeah. But um, you know, if any of our listeners do, you know, give it a shot. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's well, I think you know, my my I, I have a you know, and I've said this before and other things, and I could be wrong, but I have a really strong inclination that they're gonna finally grant it. I mean, because they have Jack, they're, they're going to grant cert on this. They're going to review this question. They're going to address this question. I mean, for nothing else, they have Judge Jackson, uh, uh, Justice Jackson now on the bench. Mm -hmm. And she was a former sentencing commissioner. And when she was a public oh. defender, she wrote a brief about how, you know, acquitted conduct was BS. And then you have Gorsuch. And he's on record in the Tenth Circuit when he was on Tenth criticizing the use of acquitted conduct. And you have Kavanaugh also. When he was uh, a circuit court judge on the D.C. Court of Appeals, he was, he uh, criticized both acquitted conduct and uncharged conduct. Wow. And, you know, and then, okay. um, and of course, you have Thomas, uh, who joined um, uh, Ginsburg and Scalia in the dissent from the denial of certain Jones way back when, when Scalia said, this has gone on long enough. So mm. there are your four. There are your four right there. Just those four alone. That's enough to grant cert. Rule of four. That's yeah. all. Yeah. So my, you know, my 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 money, my uh, martini at Old Ebbet is on that the, April 17th is going to be the day where they're going to grant cert in this as they finally, sh as they should. They find, But it's going to be earth shattering. It's going to be much, much bigger than the quick. All right. Account. So, well, let's stay tuned. We'll see what happens. Uh, so thank you so much for breaking this down. Uh, you know, the takeaway is, again, don't wait till November 1. Right. Use these to your advantage now uh, or try to get a continuance if you can. But these are big deal amendments. And I'm so glad I, I can't remember the last ever if in the, my time in federal practice, which is over 20 years that we've had super big deal amendments maybe the sunset of the assault weapons ban that was i mean i don't know this is a big deal and so oh, it, it is a big deal I'm sorry. Nice. One, yeah object to any use of acquitted conduct object to oh, any yeah. use of dism dismissed uh conduct object to all uncharged conduct all that crap that goes into a factual basis figure out a way how you can preserve that objection you know yep. factual basis in a in a plea agreement you got to preserve all that stuff start preserving it now Absolutely. Because then when you get an unusually long sentence, you can invoke the compassionate release provisions in the new guidelines. Um, bada bing. Because <laughs> we all waive our rights to appeal when we plead yeah. guilty. But anyway. Or, you know, start right. pleading <laughs> open. I mean, the easiest yeah. thing is start oh. pleading open and preserve everything. Just plead open and preserve oh. everything. Unless you're looking right. at a mandatory. All right. Yeah. Well, we're not giving 
actual legal advice, but it is an interesting yeah. suggestion. Yes. And, uh, you know, call us if you have questions about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, boy, oh boy, always a pleasure. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for breaking this down. Sentencingstats.com for anyone who wants to know more about Mark Allenbaugh. Again, visit uh, setforsentencing.com or check us out on YouTube. Subscribe, all that good stuff. We'll see you back here soon, man. Take care. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Doug. That's it for today. But before we go, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you. To you, the listener, for spending time with us today getting set for sentencing. Whether you're a lawyer, someone who could use the help, or maybe you're just a true crime buff who loves the inside scoop on how this whole thing works, I am so glad you're here, and I hope you keep listening. If you're interested in knowing more about what I do, mitigation videos, case consults, live teaching, on-demand educational content, books, articles, all of it, please visit www.dougpassonlaw.com. I'm Doug Passon. Until next time, hang in there. Wait a minute, that's a stupid way to sign off on a podcast about sentencing. Hang in there. What, what's the matter with you, man? I guess they call that gallows humor. Sorry. All right. Well, I will see you next time on Set for Sentencing. Bye-bye.